Oh, hello and welcome. We are thankful that you are here with us today and that you can join us for uh, today's webinar. I am Reverend Hector Josue Hernandez Marcial, serving as the Director of Community Engagement for the National Benevolent Association of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ of the United States and Canada. Today's webinar, Until Justice Rolls Down, Organizing Congregations Around Justice Issues, is an adaptation from a presentation of a workshop that was given during um, this, this past spring at the Virginia Regional Assembly. And this webinar is part of the MBA justice work, our workshops, our webinars, and educational training. And it also, it also sets the stage for what we are gonna be sharing and, and doing uh, next year. So you have to, to uh, keep following us uh, to be sure that you don't miss anything. As we get ready to start, I would like to inform that this webinar will be recorded and will be available for future viewing at the MBA website, mbacares.org. If you have questions throughout the webinar, we welcome you, please, please, please do so. We welcome you to use the Q and A feature by clicking uh, on the icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Um, and if by any chance we, we um, are unable to address your question, please include your name and email. And we promise that if we are unable to address your question, we will do so after the webinar is over. Um, sometimes we even, we even incorporate the questions as part of the conversation, uh, so you never know. Um, in today's webinar, we are going to provide an overview of the church's role in social justice. And we also are going to explore together how congregations can organize around issues of justice. And like I said, this is, um, this is an overview. Uh, we're gonna be sharing with you some other uh, links of some of the previous webinars that the MBA has done. So we are inviting you to keep exploring and keep educating yourself and your congregation. At this time, I want to introduce our speaker. Um, I'm really joyful and happy that, that she is here with us, Reverend Angel Sanders Johnson, who is the executive director of the Disciples Women Ministries of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ of the United States and Canada. She was born in Charleston, South Carolina and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Reverend Johnson earned a Bachelor of Art degree in sociology from uh, the Alabama A&M University. She also earned a Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt University School of Divinity and a Kelly Miller Smith Institute Certificate in Black Church Studies. Um, as a leader, she has more than 20 years of corporate faith-based and community nonprofit experience. Reverend Johnson is an ordain, is, or, is ordained in the Christian Church uh, Disciples of Christ of the United States um, and Canada, and has served in several capacities that include New Covenant Christian Church in Nashville, Nashville Tennessee, Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church from Memphis, Tennessee. She has served also in the region of Tennessee Pro-Reconciliation and Anti-Racism Commission the Healthy Boundaries Training Team of the Region of Tennessee, and the Region of Tennessee Commission of Ministry. Uh, seems, Angel, that you are 
have been a very busy <laughs> person. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Reverend, Reverend Johnson is a trained organizer through the Gamalier Network and an active member of several professional and civic organizations. And in reality, there is a lot of more things that I could share about her. I'm just going to say that we are more than happy and we are excited and we welcome you. Bienvenida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am. Always grateful to partner with NBA. Um, NBA has been a very integral and vital uh, part of my faith formation and my ministry. So anytime Hector or any or Mark or anybody calls me, the answer is already yes, right? Uh, because there's so much good work coming out of NBA, and I'm happy that as the executive director of Disciples Women, we can find even more ways to partner to further the work of God uh, on earth. So with that being said, let's get started. Um, so until justice rolls down, organizing congregations around justice issues. Uh, today, we'll look at how uh, congregations can engage in faith-based community organizing as a way to build relationships and build power in the community in order to impact the community around them in a positive way. We know that anytime we uh, show up as God's community of faith in the world, we want to leave a piece of God with whomever we've interacted with. And organizing around social justice issues is definitely one of the ways in which we do that. So we'll review a brief history of organizing, define what it is, specifically define what faith-based community organizing is, and um, Talk about how we can begin necessary steps to having those conversations and building relationships to go out and do the work of God where justice is concerned. So what is organizing? Next slide. So organizing is, next slide. Organizing is the coordination of cooperative efforts and campaigning carried out by residents to pr promote the interests of their community. So what does that mean? That means the community has gotten together around one common issue. Uh, they begin to build power from the bottom up. That means um, leaders are identified within that community and they are trained and supported to lead from within. And uh, that there is not a person or entity or organization that comes from the outside uh, that dictates and creates the agenda for them. The community will set their own agenda and set their own scope of projects and determine from within how they should go about advocating against whatever the issue is that they have identified. Uh, leaders are trained from within, and that comes from building relationships and partnering with other people. Um, people come together because they feel like there is a different, there's an issue that needs to be taken care of, right? So first, people agree that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Then they decide they want to do something about it. And they keep control of their agenda so that they are not beholden to other power structures that may uh, come back to work against them. So where did organizing come from? Organizing has been happening in human kind since before history has ever been recorded in some way, shape or form. It's existed in various contexts all over the world. We know that in this country, the first recorded strike uh, was for higher rate wages by shoemakers in 1786. Uh, we have accurate recordings of the Industrial Revolution that led to strikes from unions. Uh, the development, creation and development of economic cooperatives is a form of organizing. And then specifically faith-based organizing. 
the civil rights movement, churches were heavily involved, various communities of faith, Christian and non-Christian, the prison industrial complex. We've had a lot of faith-based organizing around uh, that issue, the privatization and the exploitation and the dehumanization of human beings in the prison industrial complex and the Poor People's Campaign, for which the Christian Church and Disciples of Christ has been heavily involved in under the leadership of Reverend Dr. William Barber. Issues persist and replicate over and over and over again. So these things are not new, right? Mm -hmm. We are um, witnessing economic disparities now with inflation post pandemic. We are looking at uh, different uh, disparities, racial, ethnic, cultural disparities that are going on now in some way, shape or form, the legislation against women's bodies. These all are issues that lead have led and continue to lead to organizing. Uh, scholar Edward Lindemann writes that a community organization is that phase of social organization which constitutes a conscious effort on the part of the community to control its affairs dramatically and to serve and secure the highest services from its specialists, agencies, and institutions by means of recognized interrelations. Next slide, please. All right. So it is a conscious effort. It is, go back one. It is a conscious effort. It's very intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not haphazard. It's very uh, well thought out and a lot of planning goes into it uh, because there is constantly something happening. And it is to the goal of gaining and remaining in control of one's own affairs and securing the highest services. So that means uh, communities, churches, organizations, groups of people who have experienced some kind of social transgression, they come together to organize, to regain or to gain control that they never had to control their own collective agenda within the community and to secure for themselves and guarantee equitable services that are um, supposed to come from their community organizations, their local, national, federal politicians, whether they are elected or appointed, uh, quality treatment and a chance at positive human flourishing. Next. I, I go ahead. Before, before we move to the next one, um, I I'm listening to you, and I think that the very first lesson that comes to my to my mind is that uh, in order for the church to engage in this type of, of work, the church needs to be part of the community. It cannot be an island. It cannot be on their own. It has to be part of the community. It has to uh, be part of of each and every aspect of, of those of, of the people that they're serving um, that way uh, in that connection it could be part of, 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 of you know the the it can help it can it can be part of the solution and I and I have a question for you um, we know that um, community power and vision rests in the community or communities. Mm -hmm. um, could you could you expand or could you reflect upon the importance of um, the community's ability to control its own affairs and, and that way gain equitable services? So when a community controls its own affairs and when their agenda is self-determining, they are one, not beholden or obligated to a system or structure or group or organization that can make decisions for them. Um, I, as an only child for a long, long time before my younger siblings came around, uh, what was I was what my parents called determined to control my environment and to keep my, the right to make a choice. I never wanted my choices taken away from me. Um, and I see it the same way in this communal setting. Uh, a community 
has the right to make its own choices um, and to determine for themselves what is best for them when they define what positive human flourishing is. Mm -hmm. Positive human flourishing is the right and the ability to grow uh, mind, body, and spirit in a healthy way. Uh, so when a community does not have that kind of control, uh, they are essentially beholden and subject to whatever organization has power, right? So organizing comes down to who has power. Uh, and I don't know any one individual or organization or group of people that want to see power over themselves to someone else. Um, I think uh, we see that happening um, when we talk about states' rights and the conflict between some states and federal, right? Um, communities want to be self-determining. Sometimes it doesn't work out well, right? Um, but communities have the right to, to control their own agenda and determine for themselves what is best for them. Um, our organizations, social agencies, government agents, political uh, persons who are elected and appointed to serve are there to do that, serve the community in a way that helps them progress in life and not uh, regress or become stagnant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Next slide, please. So where organizing is concerned, we can never talk about where organizing came from without mentioning the man, the myth, and the organizing legend by the name of Saul Alinsky. He is known as the father of organizing. And although we, humans have been organizing in some way, fashion, or form since the beginning of time, it was Saul Alinsky who put it, who codified it and put some kind of methodology around it by formalizing um, organizing. He was an American community activist and political theorist, and he worked through Chicago-based Industrial Areas Foundation, helping poor communities organize to press demands upon landlords, so fair housing. He worked with and against politicians, business leaders, and anybody who basically wanted to exploit fair housing practices in Chicago. Doing this work won him national recognition and notoriety. So responding to the impatience of what they call the new left generation activists in the 1960s, he wrote his first book, Rules of Radicals of Pragmatic Primer. So this book is basically your foundational one-on-one -on -one for community organizing and then followed up with his second book, Revelry for Radicals. He formalized what uh, most organized call cold anger. Mm. Um, and I know anger is such a bad term, right? In congregations and church and it gets a bad rep, but anger actually has uh, lots of great use when put and channeled in the right direction. In Alinsky's organizing model, he used cold anger to fuel his organizing movement. Cold anger is defined is anger that has been cooled and put to good use. It's directed towards something productive. So rather than uh, spontaneous combustions of rage, would be sh which would be known in his model as short, hot anger, uh, that anger is cool and it is uh, strategically used to drive the organizing movement. Long cold anger, that cold productive anger that sustains, that you keep kind of on the forefront of your mind of why you're doing this work is a great way to reconcile with painful past. So acknowledging what has happened and ensuring the future will be filled with more justice and less pain. So using basically your anger against mm -hmm. homelessness, against economic disparity, against gender-based violence to fuel the advocacy work that you do. 
if we can move our anger, because we're all upset about something, if we can move our anger into this space of long, cold anger, then the space in the lower uh, blue quadrant of the graph here, we're able to create the most meaningful and make the make meaning out of our anger, right? So I think that the church has missed that, right? Bible says, be angry, but sin not. So don't go out and burn the city down. Start building relationships and start advocating and organizing around the issue. Put it to good use. So what is faith-based organizing? Faith-based organizing is organizing around values that are based on a group's faith or beliefs, which are mission based on social values of faith, which most often draws its activists. So leaders, staff, mem staff members, volunteers from a particular faith group. Simply put, what it means is your faith dictates social, certain social behaviors in determining. And you are using your paradigm of faith to advocate and organize in your community. So it's you're taking your faith outside of the four walls of the church and acting on those to make the world a better place. Um, American history is replete with examples of people of faith who have uh, in a defiant manner in some ways broken the vessels of traditional and sacred values in order to serve up revolutionary social change. So the civil rights movement, poor people's campaign, SNCC, SELC, all of those organizations are interwoven, NAACP even, are interwoven in and out of faith communities to kind of create this fabric of social change and advocacy. Faith-based faith -based groups have been on the forefront of the civil rights movement and continue to be present and on the front lines of social justice uh, in this country. Um, we, we think because the civil rights movement happened decades ago, there's no use for it, but it absolutely uh, is it's more important now than ever. I had a professor say that social issues never die. Mm -hmm. They only come back in new models like a Cadillac. It's a new color, it's a new body style, it may have new technology, but it's still a Cadillac. So it goes with social issues. Um, it looks different, it's dressed different, it may incorporate different styles and behavior, but at a very foundational level, racism, sexism, xenophobia, mm -hmm. homophobia, those things continue to see through, see through our country. If, if I may add, um... Later on, we're going to be sharing some, um, you know, names of some institutions uh, that you can easily connect with, because some of these uh, faith-based organizations are national. Mm -hmm. Some of the, some of them even have um, uh, regional and statewide, but they belong to a national one. So um, that is an, an excellent way to, to, to connect your congregation, your ministry with some of those issues on, on, on bigger levels. Um, we're gonna be sharing some of that as, as a possible strategy. The other thing that I was gonna say is that uh, right now we're losing rights. Uh, so uh, it, this is a key moment for the um, reality of our country in which if, don't, if we don't fight for our rights, they're gonna keep er, er, you know, disappearing. Absolutely, so in Tennessee, there's an amendment on the ballot coming up in November uh, to eradicate slavery. Like why are we even having to vote on this in 2022? Um, but if we don't, <laughs> we know that, that they'll use that possibly to keep chipping away at our rights, right? Um, and so as the battle grounds continue in these political arenas, uh, faith-based organizing becomes a way to grow voter engagement. It becomes a way to um, educate communities on the issues on the ballot. It becomes a way to create systems uh, more equitable 
systems that replace systems that create food deserts, that create economic uh, deserts, that create uh, educational landfills where children are not being resourced. So the list goes on and on. And so yes, Hector, now more than ever, faith-based organizing becomes an integral part of how the church shows up in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, where did faith-based organizing come from? The Bible is replete with examples. Uh, a few examples I'll give you. Uh, the Exodus, right? Uh, you moving that many people out of Egypt into the promised land, take some organizing. They had a common problem. They wanted a common solution. Uh, they strategized, listened to the word of God and got up out of there in a very short version of that story. Uh, the Daughters of Zelophehad. I love this story because this is about a group of women whose life was on the line. Uh, their father had no male heir and they had to come together and come up with a plan on how to advocate for their own livelihood and inheritance. And because they came together and addressed the state, so to speak, um, and said, it's not our fault that our father didn't have a male heir. Give us what's ours. Mm -hmm. uh, they not only secured their own land, financial security and safety, they changed the law for those coming after them. So it's not, all, it's not, it's never just for right now. The work is always for into perpetuity and for the generations to come. And in the New Testament, we see that the Bible uh, records Jesus and disciples organizing all the time. Jesus uh, got a collective of, of people and said, we got a common problem. The world should know mm -hmm. my father. And they went out and organized and educated and used the tools of organizing in the name of their faith and beliefs. Um, and I'll even add the Church of Acts, right? Acts as tells the story of a community of people that work together for a collective interest. Uh, leaders emerged out of that church and out of that community, and the church was birthed out of organ out of the, them organizing and coming together. So, um, the Bible absolutely supports us doing this work in the world. And I, I'm going to add again uh, my previous comment that um, the way Jesus uh, interact was, you know, intentionally being part of the communities, reaching out to those marginalized, reaching out to those that uh, have been stigma stigmatized, and um, and understanding and learning and 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 even. Uh, changing some of his uh, uh, beliefs, the, the things that that he was taught, um, and 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 is is the perfect model for for a congregation that if you are not part of the people that you're serving of the communities around your congregation, then um, how can you really be present? How can you be um, part of of the fight? And um, and I, I, I again is uh, often the church. Uh, follows everything but Jesus, but that's that's another that's another. Hello, webinar. that's another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right, and so I think we learned something from Jesus as an organizer because you're right, Hector. Jesus went and he talked to the people in the community. He was not dealing with the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He they tried to deal with him, but he had his own way of moving around them, and he created a system around the system, right, mm -hmm. at large, the hegemonic system uh, in control to, to bring about and get his mission accomplished and his three-year ministry on this earth. Um, he, he built power from within because every time Jesus healed somebody, every time he set somebody free, every time somebody was liberated spiritually, uh, they went out and told a story. Right. And somebody, you know how we like to talk right in church and in, in neighborhoods, they told somebody and they told somebody else. And pretty soon this story about this man named Jesus was all over the place to the point that he could not run away from the people. Right. Um, so it definitely has an impact. 
definitely does. I have a I have a question for you. Um, you were talking about um, cold anger, mm -hmm. and I agree with you. Ang anger, talking about anger inside the congregations, inside our congregations. Um, I mean, it's not it's not a, a typical topic. Um, so, how could anger coincide uh, with faith based community organizing? So, there are a few things that churches do not do well at. Uh, anger, money, sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. yep. those, those are three things that, like I always say, anger, money, sex. We just, if we can avoid talking about that, we will. Yep. Uh, but here's the problem. If the church isn't angry about something, are you really being the church? Right? Uh, we are called to be this movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. We are called to be God in skin, uh, to love others, right? To feed the hungry, clothe the naked, you, you know, and, and all those things. Go out in the world and make disciples. But how are we doing that if we don't acknowledge how we feel when something is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, you need anger. You need anger to feel the wrongness, yeah. <laughs> the wrongness, right? Uh, because Jesus was not apathetic about his mission on this earth. God was not and is not apathetic about um, how God has loved us how God has created us. God was not apathetic. And so we don't have room to be apathetic. Um, and if God has given us anger, the least we can do is put it to good use. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like God, anger is not a bad thing. Anger only becomes a bad thing when you repress it, when you become destructive with it, uh, or when you become apathetic and shut down by it. Um, anger can become a gift of glory, right? When we put it to use in the world yeah. to do the good work. Right. So Hot Jun Lee, author of God and Community Organizing, A Covenantal Approach, says this, God organizes the, those called out of the world, the ecclesia, the assembly of God's citizens through worship, fellowship, mutual instruction and encouragement, prayer, and uses them to recognize the world, recognize, reorganize the world across the categories of individuals, institutions, and societies, the diaphana. Those who have been commanded to proclaim God and promote Christian faith in love and justice. So God is calling God's people right, out of these structures created by the world to reorganize and make impact that change the systems and structures of the world in a way that exemplify God's love and justice. So how Jun Lee is saying we are called to do this. This is part of our work as the community of faith. It's not the icing on the cake. It is essential to our identity. So why, why would congregations organize? Churches have a lot to do. They've got Sunday morning, they've got Easter, they've got board meetings, we've got general and regional assembly, we've got area and district meetings, but why organize? Why should the church engage the world this way? Dr. Martin Luther King often called the church to step up and step out. Mm -hmm. Stepping up to the plate to serve as a social witness to injustices such as racism, labor disparities, housing inequities, and other things. He said that the church shouldn't be master or ruler of the state, but it should be the state's conscience. It is supposed to serve as a guide and be a critic of the state, but never its tool. So King is saying, we should be on the forefront critiquing the state, the social government, 
the federal government, the local government, uh, politicians on in our neighborhoods, city council, whatever it is, whatever system and structure is controlling and moving on our behalf, critiquing them to hold them accountable. Now, during the civil rights movement, the church was like the heart of that organizing movement. Like there were meetings there, there were strategy sessions there, sometimes hiding out there. Um, and so nothing happened without the church being involved in some way, shape or form. So the church, Big C, the ch that church, Church's Universal's job is to critique the state in a way that makes the world an equitable place for everyone, not just those who can pay into the system and pay to get a front row seat. It doesn't mean that the church shouldn't be Sunday worship, but what it means is that as opposed to just being Sunday go to worship and just being a social club and just being a dog and pony show on Easter, its purpose is to always serve God's people every day of the year, 12 months out of the year, every week out of the month, every day of the week. That is why the church is here. So if churches are alive and active, their congregations must engage the community. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and again, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I might open a can of worms and, and, and it, might, it might be for a, <laughs> A follow up a conversation, um, but um, what can you say uh, about what is very present? You know, when you're talking with leaders, when you're talking with congregants, uh, about the myth that church has no business meddling, and that's that's one of the words that they use meddling mm -hmm. in affairs of the state. Remember a conversation I had with a Latino pastor, um, and 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 basically his response to me was like, "Oh no 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 no, we do this, the rest uh, that's that's the, the the government responsibility." Mm -hmm. uh, so so what can you tell me about that? What do I say about the myth or the statements that church has no business meddling in political affairs? It's a lie. <laughs> um, the ultimate goal of God's organizing, uh, the ultimate goal of the church is to create God's beloved community. Um, and God's beloved community is a just, loving, and reciprocal community where access is granted to every member, where every member is able to contribute and also receive, right? Uh, so they are putting in and they are receiving back um, access, opportunity, resources, and whatever they need to live justly and fairly. And the church, who is called to be the conscious and critique and critic of the state, um, helps guide that, right? Because if God has given us scripture and given us experience and reason to help us come into relationship with God, what does it say about God? What does it say about God's people if we are not helping to ensure that everybody has access? And we ensure everyone has access by being at the table where decisions are being made, mm -hmm. right? Everybody talks about um, food deserts how high food is becoming, which is gonna create an even bigger chasm for some of our citizens and si sisters and brothers who uh, were already on the verge of being hungry, right? Uh, and so we're gonna talk about what it means to create food drives and all these things, but what about creating systems that help open up access for them, right? It should not take a mother 45 minutes uh, to get to a grocery store from her house. Mm -hmm. It should not, um, my children should not be afraid to drive in the neighborhood that they live because they are afraid that the police 
are going to pull them over, harass them, and kill them. Right? So if, if the church is not on the forefront of that, who is? Mm -hmm. Right? Next slide. So again, like I said, the ultimate goal is to create um, the beloved community. Um, as we, as disciples of Christ say, uh, we are disciples of Christ. We're moving up a wholeness in a fragmented world. That's exactly what it means. We are creating a just equitable place that reflects the just love of God, right? So when you say faith-based organizing, and when you mention that to some people in the church, they automatically think I am on the front lines, protesting, tear gas, um, you know, these very extreme kind of concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, but organizing isn't just doing one thing. Next slide. Organizing is not monolithic. It's not monochromatic. It's not singularly focused. Successful organizing uh, by congregations and community stakeholders alike encompass many different methods and modalities to help achieve the goal. So organizing is not just charity. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Charity provides a direct response to a crisis such as hunger. We have food pantries at a lot of our churches who make sandwiches, give out food boxes, but the problem with charity is it doesn't mitigate the issue. It simply puts a band-aid on it. Charity is also very, um, it is transactional mm -hmm. and it doesn't build power for the people from the bottom up. It only is a, it is a very temporary fix. And while charity is needed, to stop the bleeding, we also have to figure out what is causing the bleeding for said problem. So, so it's good, it's needed, but it's incomplete. Correct. It is good, it is needed, it is incomplete. I can't have you do the work of the world, and I can't have you organize and train you and have you do this very hard work of faith-based community organizing if you're hungry. So I got to mm -hmm. feed you. So that you can think, right? Because <laughs> your blood sugar is low, you're frustrated, your kids are hungry. So if I want to train you up as a leader, because I've identified you as a leader, I need to feed you. So mm -hmm. we're going to stop the bleeding. It's kind of like a tourniquet. You can put a tourniquet on, but if you keep it on, it's going to kill the appendage. Right? So yep. we need it. It's good. It's incomplete. That was perfectly said. And then we have education. Education provides knowledge about a particular issue, its background, and what the tra trajectory of that problem is. It's good, it's needed, it's incomplete, right? So I've got charity, I'm feeding you so that you can focus, right? We stop the bleeding. I'm going to educate you on what the problem is, uh, but it is uh, that's not building power. That's not getting us to the goal line across the finish line. Uh, education looks like book studies, panel discussion, preaching conferences, uh, doing research. It's important because you need to know the monster you're dealing with when you deal with an issue or in, in getting prepared for an action, but it doesn't do the actual work. Um, I have seen students in my many, many, many years of school who never transition into the praxis phase. They just keep going back to get another degree. And it's great, right? But how do, do you put all that tuition and head knowledge to use in the world to impact change? So you got charity, education. You also have activism. Next slide. Before, activism. Be, oh, before, you move to, before you move to activism, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, the challenge with education is um, the way our churches work often, um, well, no, that's, that's wrong. Uh, there is a disconnection with our bodies. Um, so the, the challenge of education is that it can stay on our minds 
is on our shelves and stay there. Wow. And, and uh, it's important that we know, it's important that we learn, it's important that we get the tools, uh, some of the tools that are available. And you have shared work of, of, of pioneers and, and other people that, that have uh, engaged in, in many of these topics. But if it doesn't move us into concrete actions, then again, it's incomplete. And, and often our congregations or our leaders will stop there. Yes. They will feed, feed their minds. And somehow we think that that's enough. And then we get in the trap of what you're gonna share now. And then we, we, we feel that by knowing and by doing charity, is good, is good enough. And again, it's not bad, it's needed, but it's incomplete. You are absolutely correct. I can know how to build a house all day long, but if I don't actually get tools, nails, hammer, wood, bricks, concrete, uh, scaffolds, and start using it and putting those things in action, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of head knowledge that collects dust in your mind. And it doesn't affect change in the world at all, all right? Um, organizing just isn't activism either. Uh, activism is a visceral response to an injustice by putting your body on the line to demonstrate a violation of a person or group of people. So the March on Washington um, in, in the civil rights movement, the poor people's campaign, you see protests in Wisconsin when there was a shooter there, you know, Charlottesville. So th this is physically putting your body on the line to demonstrate uh, your anger against something. Uh, Die-ins, stand-ins, you know, uh, mock funeral processions, all those things are considered forms of activism. It's a way to demonstrate that a value has been violated. It gives you also, it also gives a person space uh, to share stories of impact rather than just letting the media take control, mm -hmm. right? So activism is useful. Uh, activism gets a lot of negative press. It gets a lot of uh, negative flack, but activism is a part of the process. Uh, it, is, it, it is a, a citizen's right to protest and, and, and to show up and demonstrate. Um, but the bad side of activism is some people get caught up in just going from rally to rally to rally and protest to protest to protest. And the movement uh, of the needle of the issue never moves, right? And you end up tired, burned out, arrested mm -hmm. and all kind of stuff. Um, and so we want to even move beyond that Right, we move beyond charity, we move beyond education, and yes, activism is physically doing something, uh, but it is only the start, it is only a piece of the puzzle. So then you have advocacy. Advocacy is addressing and asking for changes to policies and systems. This is where you are present at the table, talking to mayors, talking to your council people, talking to your school board, uh, having conversations with governors, right? Um, with organizations that hold different arenas of power in your community. The power lies in the government, police, city council, et cetera, uh, and so you have to make conversation and, and more than make conversation, build relationship and come to some meaningful uh, place where there's a mutual respect, even though you may not agree to start asking and making demands, right? So in organizing, there's always an ask. We just don't show up to a meeting for the sake of showing up to a meeting. We move, we go and show up to change systems and policies. And this is where this happens. Um, and so a well-rounded model of organizing encompasses all of these things. And there will be times in your process where one may be more appropriate that to, than another. So we have organized, we've gotten a group, we've identified an issue, we've had a power analysis, we have identified the power players that sit at the table and make decisions. We have gone out and had one-on-ones and talked to them. We start showing up at city council meeting and we make an ask to the city council. 
when they decide they don't do it, we're just going to protest in front of your house until you either get tired of us and change the system or you start a negotiation process with us and we come to a mutual agreement. So all of them work hand in hand. None of these things alone constitutes organizing, but they are tools that we use in the process of organizing to shift the systems in our direction that we want them to go. So all of this is for what purpose? All of this, charity, activism, advocacy, organizing, having these conversations, going out into the world, doing stuff we've never done before, is for the sake of building power. Next slide. What is power though? Power is organized people plus organized money. We gotta have both in order to move the needle on systems that we would like to address. We can have all the money in the world. We have some very wealthy churches and they are not on the forefront of moving uh, the needle on social justice issues. Um, we have uh, large groups of people, but they don't have the money to fund the movement. You have to have both. So it's one thing to have a group of people, your congregation. It's another thing to have money, your ministry budget, taking up offerings, things like that. But unless you can bring those two components together for the common goal of changing said system issue, disparity, inequity, um, re you really don't have power. So you've got to use them both. So um, I'm going to make an, an uh, I'm going to make a question that is, I think is obvious, at least for me, but it might help the flow. Um, and it's, it's, it has two parts. Um, why power becomes necessary for change? That will be the first part. And then uh, what are some examples? What are some uh, different areas or different arenas, I meant to say, of power? You know, how that might, might look like. Um, for 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 this concept that we're talking with mm -hmm. for our congregations our mm -hmm. efforts mm -hmm. uh so what there are different arenas of power so you have political power um that is power that um political politicians will have because they are actually creating writing legislating you have voting or a voting arena of power um, those are the actual voters, those that are going to the poll. That's why integrated voter engagement is so important uh, because integrated voter engagement and the voting, the voting arena of power affects the political arena of power because the people we vote in ultimately are going to create, legislate, and adjudicate laws. Um, so you have, you have even educational arenas of power, uh, because they, there are groups of people, their whole institutional knowledge that's needed by these community organizations, uh, to move. Um, and, and, and so you, basically anywhere you see a group of people, there's some kind of arena of power. Congregations. Uh, almost like sometimes liken power to the way they do anger. It's a bad thing. We should mm -hmm. be meek, mild, humble. We should not be power hungry. Uh, we should be power hungry for the sake of exacting God's love across this earth, right? Uh, I think we have many examples where Jesus was angry. Mm -hmm. He flipped over tables, right? Uh, because uh, people had basically turned the temple into a payday loan office, right? Um, God has been angry. Uh, but in any instance, just about where you see God destroying, uh, God has made a way to create something new. And so what the congregations, when they hone in on this kind of power, organize people and organize money, uh, Congregations create a kind of power uh, that 
manifests and puts their righteous indignation to use. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is okay to have power. Um, we tell our children all the time, use your powers for good and not evil. Right? Do you want to be Captain America? Do you want to be Storm? Do you want to be Iron Man or do you want to be Loki? <laughs> you know, if you're a Marvel fan, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Um, use your powers for good and not evil. We are not being good stewards of the resources God has given us if we are not doing anything to make the world a better place. Amen. So, so all of that was a lot of information, and I'm sure the question is, where do I start? How do we begin organizing and engaging the community? Well, here is a quick, and I do mean quick, step-by-step -step approach with getting started. First, you want to go through a discernment process. You want to, you want to assess, discern your context. Who's in your congregation? What populations and groups of people make up your congregation? Uh, what is your capacity? How much can you do? How much interest around hunger or whatever the issue is, how much, how much interest or buzz around your congregation may be happening around that issue? And then what's your level of commitment? Um, some, some churches, they do charity very well. And that's their lane, right? Uh, some churches have the capacity to do more. And they can say, yes, we have a food pantry, but we also are going to form a small social action committee. Um, and I'm, we're going to take five people to city council meetings and come back because there's some development going on around our church that would be detrimental to the neighborhood and would cause some disparities for the citizens there, right? So you have to clarify that. And then, then decide where you wanna be. Once you figure out, okay, here's what I'm working with now, where do I wanna be? So what's my self-interest? What issue is uh, gnawing at me, causing me anger? and discuss and why so you got to always know and be clear about your why why are you so interested in this work why does uh police brutality bother you so much why is homophobia uh eating at you every time you see a trans person of color get killed right what is it um and then figure out what available resources you have around you and so that means people that means money, that means uh, organizations. Uh, and so you wanna figure out who are your potential partners because this is not work that you can do alone. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus was not an island unto himself. He even got a crew together and said, okay, we got some work to do. We gotta go out and do this and we have to do it together. And so once you, figure out where you are and you're clear about where you want to be, the next thing you have to do is start to build relationships. Next slide. Let me, let me interject. Uh, sure. this, this is not lineal. This is cyclical. This is a process, a constant process. So um, an, an, an experiential process that um, you might begin with one idea or with one, uh, with with some type of, of idea of of where you are, where you want to be, and then as soon as you connect, as soon as you begin to um, to understand, to become, to be, suddenly, oop, some of those uh, uh, ideas will change. And amen for that. And 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 it's a constant. It's a constant. It is a constant. And more than one thing is happening at the same time, right? So you may be discerning and clarifying at the yep. same time because you're not doing all of this work internally, right? You exactly. are talking to someone in your congregation and said, did you see all those homeless people sitting on the corner? Or did you notice that we have an aging uh, population in the neighborhood that we're located in? 
I, I don't, you know, and we don't have a grocery store nearby. So is there a need for a food pantry or is there a need to start talking to city council about how we get some development in here and get a Kroger or a Publix or whatever the local grocery store in? So you're having these, you're having multiple conversations, internal and external at the same time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's not one, two, three, and then you're done because you're constantly doing these things and constantly yep. assessing and discerning, even as you're working on uh, your, even uh, as you're working on the issues. So once you clarify and you've got a pretty good idea of where you are and where you want to be, you've got to start building relationships. You have to be in relationships inside the community, inside your congregation, and beyond the walls of your congregation, uh, out in the world, around your local community. Because uh, finding like-minded people yep. to help in with this work uh, is going to determine your success. If you think you can do this work by yourself, you mm -hmm. can't. <laughs> you can't nope. um you will be burned out frustrated upset and a whole list of other things um so what you what you have to do is you have to talk to people one-on-ones go to somebody find out who they are what they're interested in why they feel the way they feel about said issue uh and say hey do you want to work with me on this and then they go out and have some one-on-ones and you continue having one-on-ones. And before you know it, you've got a team, mm -hmm. right? So these conversations are not haphazard, but they are very intentional uh, with, one, with other people to learn about what drives them, right? What drives them? What is it that uh, makes them feel so passionately about being hungry? Right. This is a process of discovery uh, that should lead to knowing whether the other person is interested or motivated in doing the work alongside with you. And the goal of building relationships in your congregation and in the community is to eventually create a team of people who can help champion your cause. Uh, it, could, it could be a social justice ministry, but the goal is not charity. Uh, so while that may be a necessary part of it, it's not the end goal. It's not handing out food basket on your church's parking lot. It's addressing the system that create the need for you to hand out those food baskets on the church's parking lot. And so you have to uh, have conversations on the inside of the congregation determine who's on, who can do this work alongside you and then you go out into the world and you're having conversations so you uh begin the process of community engagement which mm -hmm. is not a beginning middle and end it is an ongoing mm -hmm. thing that never ends uh community engagement is the process of working collaboratively collaboratively uh, with and through groups of people with similar interests. Uh, right. Community engagement is a vehicle to bring about communal, systemic, and institutional change. It involves partnerships and coalitions and cannot be done in isolation. I don't think I can say that enough. Yep. You cannot do this work alone. And so people often, churches, congregations confuse community engagement with community outreach. Yep. And so I just want to lift up a few things on the next slide that highlight the differences between the two. So community outreach is a short term. It is beginning, middle, end. I want to give out 500 food baskets on the second Saturday of the month. Uh, but community engagement is long term, right? So you have uh, introduced yourself to the community and now you have taken the community on the date and now you are getting to know the community, right? So you are in this long term relationship building process, right? Um, community outreach is uh, marketing. It is, I have this event, come to it right? It becomes transactional. 
Um, but like I said, relationship building, it is ongoing. It is what can I do? What can A do for B? What can the church do for the community rather than what can we do together? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Uh, the one group benefits the most. The congregation is giving an outreach. I'm going to give out toys for Christmas to the Angel Tree and Dove Tree kids. Uh, but in community engagement, the community is benefiting, right? Um, and the collective success is because of what congregation and community have done together. Community outreach is transactional. I'm giving you something. I'm providing you something. You're taking it. Uh, and again, it's begin beginning, middle, and end. It's directional. Once I'm done, I'm done. But community engagement, it never ends. It never ends. So even as you take on different issues and your focus changes, community engagement never stops because it's community engagement that's going to tell you what the issues in the community mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have faith-based community organizing without being engaged. Like yep. literally, you got to put yep. a ring on it with yep. the community and say, we are together uh, into perpetuity to solve these problems. Yeah, and, and, and again, you cannot come, you cannot engage the community, you cannot uh, be part of the community. Um, with a plan, with, with a, 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 a pre-conceptualized -conce plan mm -hmm. of what you need. Uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, almost as a colonial way. Uh, that relationship will change you, will change your congregation and, and, and then together for the well-being of everybody, then the actions will take place. Um, Community outreach can connect you with community engagement or can allow the church to be and become. Yeah. Um, I have a, a concrete example. We, when I was pastoring every year, we had um, a uh, soccer, soccer camp free for all the kids of the congregation, uh, of, of the communities surrounding the church. And um, that really connect us with the community that allow us to be one-on-one -on -one and and really meet our neighbors and and that allowed all of us to together to to you know to fight for the well-being uh of of all our our communities so it was it was a community outreach can be a synonym of, of being a good neighbor or being an intentional neighbor Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in the engagement is, is, is something bigger uh, that one can help the other, but but community outreach is incomplete. Correct, absolutely correct. You can start it, it, your engagement may start with an outreach event, but it can't be just that. Yep. Right, because. When you have the outreach event and you start talking to people, you're finding out their stories. Uh, there's so much power in people's stories, right? Um, and if you don't know their stories, if you don't know their why, if you don't know why they're hungry, you can't address their issue. If you don't know why um, they are walking an hour to school, you can't address their issue. So it's only a piece of it. It's definitely only a piece of it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so when you uh, discern your why, when you clarify where you are, figure out where you wanna be, you start having uh, conversations in your organization, in your congregation, and you say, okay, I got other people who are uh, interested in this issue. You can start building your team. Next slide. Um, those one-on-ones, those conversations that you're having with other people in your congregation, that's how you identify your leadership team. Everybody uh, in the world of organizing is a leader in some way, shape, or form because they all bring something to the table. And so as you identify people who agree to come alongside you, here's where your team building process 
uh, begins. And so as you're identifying the team that's going to work alongside you to champion this cause, you're going to also need to equip them. So you're going to need to train them. You're going to need to um, give them all of the information. So here's where education comes in, right? Uh, we are using charity as an entry point for community engagement, perhaps, but we are also using education as a tool to equip your leadership team. Uh, and once the leadership team is properly trained and, and brought up to speed on the issue that you'll be addressing and the team, the leadership team comes up with a plan, you're going to start engaging other volunteers and say, we are forming a coalition, a social justice ministry, a social action committee. We're formed to do this. We want to work on food disparity. Mm -hmm. Would you like to work with us, right? And how do you feel about it? And so you start building the team around the core team uh, because you need many hands to do this heavy work. And as you bring on more volunteers, your capacity grows to do more work in the world. And so as your team grows and your capacity increases, you will want to support your team, leadership and volunteers to make sure they have all the resources they need. So training them on how to do a one-on-one, -on -one, helping them decide and, uh, and discern who are the decision makers in your community where the issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is concerned, right? Because we don't need to talk to a librarian about food disparity. We need to talk to the city councilman and decide who, how decisions are being made about development around that community. We need to perhaps talk to corporate headquarters of particular grocery stores that may be a local chain, but seem to be absent from this particular community. Um, I have had conversations with corporate headquarters of certain grocery store chains, and they have flat out told me, we won't put a grocery store there because crime is too high mm -hmm. or because the demographic doesn't dictate that this will be a marketable place for us. And so we have to uh, come to the table and have conversation about why that those uh, behavior patterns are disparaging. Right? But it also shows the complexity of justice, right? Because grocery stores don't want to come into this neighborhood because crime is high. Well, crime is high because unemployment is high, because there are some practices and some legislation that uh, keep certain populations from working. And so they turn to illegal practices. So it, it, it becomes this very complicated web, right? And so uh, as you get deeper and deeper into the issue and you discover, because you're always in a process of discovery, you find, uh, find out more and more information. And so you will have to send your leaders and your volunteers to training, right? And here, that's where your partnerships will come in handy. So once you've built your team, you've got a team of volunteers, what you want to do is seek organizations that are already doing the work. It's much easier to find yeah. organizations that are doing the work because believe me, as many social justice issues yep. that exist in the world, there are organizations that uh, are working on it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, what you see on the slide are just exa some examples of those. I am a Gamaliel organizer, a trained organizer, which is the same organization uh, that President Barack Obama was trained up, up under as a grassroots organizer. And so the national body, oftentimes, such as Gamaliel or Faith in Action, they have state tables, yep. state bodies, and local bodies. So for example, in Tennessee, Gamaliel has MICA, which is located in Memphis, uh, NOAA, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope in uh, Middle Tennessee. Caleb is in Chattanooga. And so you have these different bodies. And so you can see the national umbrella, how it filters down and supports the local bodies. And each group works on issues that are germane 
to its locale. So uh, NOAA in Nashville works on issues, educational disparities, uh, discipline disparities under the education realm and criminal justice reform realm, economic disparities and affordable housing. Micah has some different um, similar, but also different foci because the locales are different and the contexts are different. Um, and so find somebody that's already doing the work. Faith-based coalitions exist everywhere and they're great places to start because they have so many resources. Um, as a trained organizer, I have spent uh, weeks, uh, days in training um, I usually would go to training three or four times a year uh, in some way, shape, or form. There, Gamelia has a, a forum for specifically for women organizers. They have their larger training and their different levels of training there. And so um, you don't have to recreate the machine <laughs> and reinvent the wheel. Uh, partner with those who are doing the work because it's going to help with your resource uh, allocation and availability. Um, I want to add, uh, for example, Faith in Action, mm -hmm. um, that is a national uh, group um, here in Indianapolis, uh, Faith in Indiana. They have a, um, I think it's a monthly uh, clergy meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you are a leader, if you are a pastor, you're a leader, and you don't know how to begin, I will invite you to Google, find out when they're meeting, and go and be be part, be a neighbor. Uh, know know your your uh, fellow clergy, and begin to hear what is happening. Uh, that's that's how I did it. I knew I needed to to get involved. I knew there were a lot of needs because of interactions with the community. And I knew I cannot do it alone. I couldn't do it alone. So I Googled it. I found where they were meeting. I show up. And, and, and again, it was, it was a process in which learning and sharing what I was learning with the leaders of the congregation, making the connections with the community, identifying leaders from the community, together going to Faith in Indiana events, learning, getting, getting a train, even by, 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 by them. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a concrete and an intentional way of becoming neighbors and fighting together uh, with all our neighborhoods for the well-being of the city, for the well-being of all of us, regardless if you are Latino, Black, white, you know, whatever. Um, so they are people already doing, their are structures already functioning and functioning well. Um, so you don't have to begin from scratch. You don't That's have right. to, you don't have to figure out everything. You just have to move uh, valiantly with faith and allow the spirit to, to move you, your congregation and reach out. Absolutely, right? And so this is not, uh, and the partnerships can look so many different ways, yep. right? Yep. It may start with two pastors saying, this is an issue. Yep. Right. Uh, I'm going to pull a couple of people from my church. You pull a couple of people from your church and let's go to lunch and talk about this. Yep. Uh, and so many hands really do make light work. And when uh, I believe when God's people put their heads together, there's no limit to what we can do. Um, I think if I could just if there's one thing that I, I would say is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to do the work. Next slide. Um, you know, don't be afraid of anger. Don't be afraid of um, resistance. Don't be afraid of agitating people, right? Uh, Saul Alinsky says the organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the mm -hmm. resentments of the people uh, of the community. So we've got to like start rubbing the layers of systemic hate and disparity and inequities off 
before we can really get to the core and start building something new. Um, don't be afraid. Agitation is a tool that organizers love because agitation is what causes other people to think, is what causes you to think. Because mm -hmm. while you're having one-on-ones and talking to other people, you're also questioning yourself, right? You're checking your own motivations. You're thinking about your own personal experiences. And, and, and you don't have to be friends. <laughs> you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't have to be friends. What you have to do is uh, have a common interest and a common goal. That's it. And so Hector, I just, um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to even be able to just, you know, have this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put it in the digital atmosphere because I, I want congregations to be as equipped as possible for having um, to do the work. Right? We've got to do the work. Yeah. So um, time has betrayed us. We have, um, you know, we, we, I think that there is so much that we could share. Um, and we can even share about our own experiences, um, but we want to honor um, the time. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have some resources, some links, some concrete links that you can um, when you when you access this presentation, you can click and you can be connected. Um, there is uh, previous work from the MBA. Uh, that you can expand and you can probably use to train or to begin this conversation or continue this conversation with some of your leaders. And, um, and yeah, we're going to share the slides uh, when, when I, I just, I'm answering Sara Rudolph, uh, who just asked a question. We are going to have the um, uh, presentation uh, available online and also uh, we just put on um on the chat the link for the slides um so the idea is that this can help you your ministry your neighborhood to begin this conversation and and move you into engaging uh, the community um we have some questions but again i want to honor time so I just want to ask one question that I think is important. Um, we are living in very challenging times. We are living in times in which um, less and less we are seeing each other as a community, and uh, especially from the political point of view, um, uh, the the sense of seeing the other as the enemy is is bold now is is it is the gospel of of many white supremacist evangelicals or evangelics um so in 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 a world of that polarity uh, how how can we how can we how the congregations can move how can we advocate um, beyond the blue and the red. How can we advocate in the purple? Yes. Um, so I think it's important for us to uh, keep our focus. Um, and if we can agree uh, that in God's covenantal love for us, um, we have, um, in God's covenantal love for us, God has equipped us with the desire, the passion, and the, and the want to make the world a better place. Uh, we can trust that God will help us discern common interests, right? Uh, organizer says no permanent friends, no permanent en mm -hmm. enemies, only mm -hmm. permanent mm -hmm. interests. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we navigate and work in the purple uh, by remembering that the congregation is not a space for a red blue battleground. It is a space for us to figure out how to 
on a very practical basis, uh, in a very tangible way, make God's love uh, evident on this earth. Yeah, I, I, when I ask, when I have been asked similar questions, my answer is I have been arrested by both political parties. Uh, so uh, the issue is the issue, regardless who is in the power. Who is in the power could make it worse, but um, you know if we are um, fighting for the well-being, for the abundant life of all of us. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's red or blue. Uh, we are called to 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 fight for that, to 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 fight against uh, um, um, injustices, regardless the the color. Um, so fortunately, this is this is almost you know we're almost at the end. Um, and um, again, I am inviting you to connect with uh, the MBA uh, MBA. Uh, cares.org uh, and you can uh, there connect with some of the other material that we have done in the past um, and like I said already this webinar will be available soon on our web, web page and we ask you to use it to allow this conversation to, uh, to take place in your own congregation and and to share these resources with others um, for more information about the MBA Community Engagement Program, as well as the rest of the MBA programs, the Mental Health and Wellness Initiative, the Social Entrepreneurship, the Young Adult Leadership Development, the Prison and Jail Ministries Initiative, and, and, and more, um, please you know, connect with us and, and explore some of our work. And, and also, um, Angel, I don't know if you want to say it's something, I mean, I mean, you are. Uh, how, how can people get uh, in touch with you? Yes, yeah, so you can always connect with Disciples Women uh, via website, www.discipleswomen.org. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also email Disciples Women at dhm.disciples.org uh, to email any questions, any comments. Um, I am always here. Uh, I am thankful to be in this seat where I can share uh, and, and do the work that God has called me to do. Well, once again, um, we are more than grateful for your ministry, for your witnessing, and for uh, this presentation. Um, stay in touch with the MBA, and um, I wish all of you um, a beautiful day, and my ask is that this uh, topic, this material does not uh, end in a corner of your uh, mind collecting dust. Allow the spirit to move through this, and allow your feet your hands and your mouth to to do to be to become the gospel the gospel of an abundant life for everybody many blessings <laughs>